The discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb is one of the most substantial archaeological finds of the 20th century. Tut used to be one of the lesser-known Egyptian pharaohs, but after his newly uncovered tomb made front-page news, he became the most famous pharaoh in the world. But why was he so popular? And how was his lost tomb found in the first place? Well, today, we're digging up the dirt on the search for King Tutankhamun's tomb. Before we start excavating, make sure you subscribe to the Weird History channel and leave a comment to let us know what other historical mysteries you'd like to see unearthed. All right, if you know the Steve Martin song, it's time to start singing along. In 1907, lawyer Theodore M. Davis and his team of archaeologists excavated an unmarked pit in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Located along the Nile in Upper Egypt, the Valley of the Kings was the burial site of most pharaohs from around 1540 to 1075 BCE, so it wasn't abnormal to find ancient artifacts buried there. In this case, Davis was mostly underwhelmed by his findings, which included linen sheets, sawdust, unfired clay, and broken mud seals. However, several of the linen sheets and mud seals had the name King Tutankhamun inscribed on them. Apparently, his mom wrote his name on all his clothes. Two years later, Davis's team continued their search and came across another important find, an unfinished chamber containing gold foil with Tutankhamun's name on it. Davis concluded that the unimpressive structure was the tomb of the little-known pharaoh and officially declared the Valley of Kings exhausted. Of course, Davis was wrong. The real tomb wouldn't be discovered for another 13 years, just a few feet away from the pit they excavated in 1907. Way to check your work there, Teddy. Back in 1899, British archaeologist Howard Carter was appointed Inspector of Monuments for Upper Egypt for the Egyptian Antiquities Service. An impressive title, but not as cool sounding as Tomb Raider. Carter honed his skills under renowned Egyptologists and supervised several expeditions, including the early work of old Teddy Davis. He resigned from the service in 1904, but three years later, the call to adventure proved to be too strong as he came under the employ of George Edward Stanhope Molly New Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Now that is an impressive title. Historically speaking, the longer it takes to say a person's name, the more esteemed they are. Funded by Lord Carnarvon, Carter would finish what Davis started in the Valley of the Kings. In over a decade of excavation, Carter's team found multiple looted tombs and sepulchers with coffins, statuary, and other funerary items. However, their biggest find came in November of 1922, just after they were informed Carnarvon was going to pull their funding. Presumably, Carter added, works well under pressure to his resume shortly thereafter. With funds dwindling, Carter and his team returned to the site of an excavation near the tomb of Ramses VI. On the morning of November 4, 1922, they began to clear away a smattering of ancient workmen's huts, and one of the water boys unwittingly exposed the beginning of a staircase. After some investigation, Carter's team realized the terminus of the staircase was a tomb located under that of Ramses VI. The tomb entrance and its seals appeared to be intact, with the latter indicating the tomb, quote, belonged to somebody of high standing. Carter sent word to Lord Carnarvon, who made the journey from England to Egypt with his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert. In the three weeks it took them to arrive, Carter and his team cleared as much debris as they could, revealing 16 stairs and an impression on the doorway that read, Tutankhamun. It was also apparent that the tomb had been opened and reclosed at least twice, indicating it may have been used more than once, or that mummies are real. On November 20th, 1922, Lord Carnarvon and his daughter arrived in Cairo. Six days later, they finally opened the door to the main burial chamber. In Carter's words, as one's eyes became accustomed to the glimmer of the light, the interior of the chamber gradually loomed before one, with its strange and wonderful medley of extraordinary and beautiful objects heaped upon one another. Our sensations and astonishment are difficult to describe as the better light revealed to us the marvelous collection of treasures. Difficult to describe? You did a pretty good job, Carter. 
Once inside the tomb of King Tutankhamun, the team began what would become an eight-year excavation. They discovered the burial site was made up of numerous sections, a foyer, an antechamber, a burial chamber with a treasury, and an additional annex. While the antechamber and annex had been largely ransacked, there were still plenty of spoils in Tut's tomb. The items Carter and his team found there were significant because they were intact rather than in fragments, making it more representative of a royal burial, devoid of the lingering questions, confusion, and speculation that accompanied many excavations. Alongside jars, jewelry, baskets, and over a hundred walking canes, Carter found noteworthy artifacts beyond his wildest dreams. The treasury was home to a large shrine-shaped chest and statues of the four tutelary goddesses of the dead. There were also parts that could construct six chariots, and Tutankhamun's chariots were, according to later scholars, the earliest high-performance machines, the Ferrari of antiquity. They boasted an elegant design and an extremely sophisticated and astonishingly modern technology. So, in addition to everything else we know about him, King Tut was apparently a drift racer. Two years into the excavation, Carter and his team turned their attention to Tut's coffin, beginning the indelicate process of pulling back the layers of each of the smaller coffins they found inside, like a coffinception. To melt away the resins holding the coffins together, Carter left them in the hot sun. When that foolproof plan didn't work, the excavation team lined up several paraffin lamps to try to dislodge the coffins, increasing the temperature to as much as 932 degrees Fahrenheit. Egypt gets hot, but not that hot. And it did the trick. In the meticulous notes Carter kept during his excavation, he recorded that each coffin had a consistent pattern of feathers decorating them. The innermost coffin was made of gold. Once opened, the golden coffin revealed the body of King Tut, wearing a burial mask. Carved with a striped headdress pattern and a beard, the mask was made out of gold, gems, and glass. It has since become one of the most identifiable items to come out of King Tut's tomb, but it wasn't easy to extricate it from the body, almost like it was never meant to be taken off. Carter's colleague, Dr. Douglas Derry, covered the mummy in wax before cutting open the wrappings. The archaeologist slowly peeled away the bandages from the body, removing amulets, jewels, and other items attached to the wrappings in the process. And still, they couldn't free the mask. You know, it really seems like maybe that mask was meant to stay put. Too many horror movies have started this way, guys. In the end, they quote, used hot knives as an alternative to wielding a hammer and chisel to free it. Which is good, because once you're chiseling a golden mask off a dead king, it's more of a smash and grab than an excavation. Once news broke about Tutankhamun's tomb, Tut mania erupted across the world, inspiring clothing trends, music, jewelry, and movies. People began to decorate their homes using Egyptian-style statues, columns, and hieroglyphics. It was sort of like when everyone got really into Australia in the 1980s. But not all of it was positive. Rumors began to swirl around the legend of a curse on King Tut's tomb. The legend of the curse spread like wildfire, allegedly claiming its first victim when Lord Carnarvon died in 1923, only a year after the tomb was opened. Keep in mind, it's possible the curse may have been dreamed up by Howard Carter himself to try and keep unruly media and spectators at bay. But regardless of how the rumors got started, people were clamoring to learn more about the newly unveiled king. During the initial autopsy on the body in 1925, researchers determined Tutankhamun was between 17 and 20 years old when he died, and later scholars were able to pinpoint more precisely to 19. While he was originally believed to be about 5 feet 6 inches tall, that was later revised to 5 feet 11 inches tall, though his body was quite frail. So, Maybe you play him as a second string forward, but he isn't starting anytime soon. King Tut's physical appearance included a club foot, a bone disorder, and a cleft palate, all likely due to inbreeding, as his mother and father were full siblings, which was fairly common in royal dynasties. For his entire life, Tut was probably in pain, always had a limp, and was forced to use one of the 130 canes found in his tomb presumably gifts from his sister mom and brother dad. 
The real intrigue surrounding the young pharaoh, however, involves how he perished. A 2005 CT scan showed researchers that King Tut had an infection in his body, something that perhaps arose in conjunction with a broken leg he suffered shortly before his death. DNA testing in 2010 posits another theory. Tutankhamun had malaria, which may have wreaked particular havoc on him due to a weakened immune system. Even though CT scans and DNA have offered some clarity into the life and death of Tutankhamun, there is still little definitive information about the pharaoh. This only adds to the tantalizing enigma of King Tut, which has manifested in hundreds of thousands of tourists visiting his tomb since it was open to the public. But it wasn't until 2009 that archaeologists and preservationists joined forces to try to conserve the pharaoh's final resting place. The Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities and the Getty Conservation Institute spent 10 years mitigating damage brought on by years of tourist activity, clearing out dust, and treating the painted walls. The Grand Egyptian Museum is set to open soon and will serve as the home to all of the artifacts that came out of King Tut's tomb. The museum, announced in 1992, has cost more than a billion dollars and will also house items relocated from other museums and storage facilities throughout Egypt. The recent efforts to preserve and display these important historical findings will almost certainly result in a continued interest in King Tutankhamun and ancient Egyptian culture. Hopefully, as the years go by, we'll unravel more of the mysteries attached to the young pharaoh and his ancestors. Someone call Brendan Fraser! So what do you think? Which item in King Tut's tomb do you find the most interesting? Let us know in the comments below. And after that, make sure you check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.